How's it going everyone? Dr. Ben here and today we're going to be talking about a really really important topic that's often not talked about and it's about the health inequities and access barriers that trans migrants face when they immigrate or migrate to the United States. And I think this is a topic that kind of looks at intersections of being trans and being a minority and a lot of these topics get never get talked about in the um in the in the popular interwebs so i thought it would be very important for me as a physician to kind of talk to you all about yes trans people are people who experience lots of different types of marginalization and if you're a trans person of color and if you're a trans person of color who also happen to be an immigrant you experience you may experience a ton a ton more disparities compared to other folks who are more privileged regardless of their identities also super quickie show and tell but i just got these really cool muscle fit scrubs you can't see it on this lens because it's a bit too squeezed in i'm thinking about getting a more wider lens in the future but it has my name embroidered on them super cool i wanted to show it off to y'all but back to the more serious topic at hand let's talk a lot about you know what are some of the disparities and some of the troubles that trans migrants especially trans migrants who cross the southern border of the united states and try to live their lives here afterwards and some of those discriminatory factors and disparities that they face because there's two ways that you can look at it. You can look at pre-migration disparities and some of the reasons why someone may decide to migrate to the US. And then once you get here, you realize this is not the land of daisies and ponies. Uh, there are even more marginalization that you may face based on your mi migrant status. And that's deemed as post post-migration inequities. And the research that's been done is very limited, but um, PhD student Aisha Chowdhury, who's getting her PhD, recently published an LGBTQ health journal, a scoping review that looked at 11 different studies that kind of tried to pinpoint some of those disparities that they face. But I'll also be talking about some of the disparities that I've heard organizers, people in the community that I grew up with in Atlanta talk about when it comes to accessing gender affirming care as a non-English speaking, a primarily non-English speaking migrant person crossing the southern border of the United States to establish care here and build a better life for themselves. So let's first talk a lot about some of the challenges that trans migrants face pre-migration, which means before they decide to take the plunge to come here to the United States in an attempt to seek a better life for themselves. The first thing is that trans migrants from their originating home countries face a lot of stigmatization. I mean, we face stigmatization here in the US, but sometimes in our home countries, we experience a lot more. So I was born in Bangladesh. I immigrated, immigrated here fairly young, but if I were to grow up there, uh, being a sexual and gender minority in my home country is very, very hard. Yes, there are communities, there are supportive communities, but as a law itself, it's not very inclusive and we're not even allowed to get married. If you've been watching the news lately, India just struck down the, the ballot in their ballot. They were proposing of legalizing same sex marriage, but they decided not to follow through with it. So it's very hard as a South Asian person for me to kind of come to grips with the fact that where I am originally from is a very oppressive place for me to live my true self and to be recognized if I were to ever get married with someone and have that recognition be a part of the law. So I can definitely see why people choose to come here. I mean, I'm very grateful to come here at a very young age, but some people it's a form of survival to come here. So this kind of ostracization, also if you are poor, uh, I mean, you face multiple marginalizations. You, if the, if you're from a area of the world that's very violence prone because of underdevelopment or under-resourcement, you may be subject to things like depression, PTSD, and anxiety. Though those were the three primary uh, comorbid 
conditions that this study found and the scoping review found of those 11 different studies that trans people before they migrated here had increased levels of depression, anxiety, and subject to traumatic stressors that predisposed them to the risk of developing PTSD either currently or in the future. So that is one aspect of it if we look at it through a healthcare mental health lens, but also, uh, like I've said, there's a lot of other components, such as if you are from an area that's war-torn, if you are from an area that's very, very much under-resourced, you can't even get clean water. Coming here is, is amazing, and it allows you an avenue to not just be yourself, but it gives you the hope that you will be at a place where you are more accepted as a trans person and you can get the care that you need. Getting gender affirming care is a privilege here, even though it's being struck down for you in so many states. For a lot of people, it is, there is still accessibility beyond what they have in their home countries. And I'm not here to undermine the kind of disparities we face living here. I mean, I am very much aware I'm living in North Carolina right now where it's very hard for me to even find a primary care provider that's a, that can and is comfortable with giving me hormones. And this will kind of weave itself into what are the struggles that trans migrants face when they get here? I mean, we have this idea that of course, you know, we, we might have an opportunity to actually pursue our our goals for gender affirmation in this new country. But Yet again, we're faced with new challenges that other trans people who grew up here, who know how to speak English, are less prone to than trans migrants who immigrate rather recently and are aiming to get gender affirming care and aiming to get some form of validation in their identities. So one thing I really wanna note is that uh, this scoping review primarily had information on transgender migrant women. However, I do believe that a lot of the stressors that's expressed, the post-migration stressors that are expressed in these in the scoping review actually applies to multiple uh, gender minorities and sexual minorities. Uh, it's just hard to document in the literature what those are because oftentimes uh, transgender men go in invisible and it's much easier to recruit transgender women because they're more plugged in with the healthcare networks and the healthcare research networks just because of historically it's been a bit more open uh, to transgender women. I'm not going to talk about all of that in this video but that's something to note that most of the studies that we talk about and most of the stressors we talk about particularly are in the lens of transgender women specifically transgender migrant women from Latin America however like I've said before a lot of this applies to many of us. So let's look at first from a healthcare lens. Once you get here, it's incredibly hard as a non-English speaking person to find gender affirming care providers. You can't just go to any primary care provider and expect them to know about gender affirming care. You can't really expect them to be accepting of your gender identity because we know America's history and healthcare history of trans people getting access to care. So uh, you have this hope that you go to any doctor and they can give you your hormones, but looks like Dr. J from this generic primary clinic <laughs> name uh, doesn't even know what the term transgender is and doesn't even know that you can take estrogen and testosterone for gender affirming care. And then you're traumatized because this becomes a very, very uncomfortable, a very uncomfortable uh, clinic experience for you. So you avoid going to the doctor for about two years because that was that was not okay and then turns out you get charged two hundred dollars for the visit because you don't have insurance and god forbid that you do not have paperwork to legitimize your immigration here then you don't have access to health insurance i mean even if you have a green card you don't have access to a lot of the uh, health insurance rights that citizens have here so you're out of luck unless you have a job turns out being trans and trying to gain employment here is incredibly hard because of how people stigmatize against you by how you look and whether or not you have passing privilege. But oh my god, I really really need gender affirming care, that's why I came here. Let me look up on the internet. Oh no, literally every website for gender affirming care, every clinic website that has 
gender affirming care listed on it is completely in English. And then when I show up to the clinic saying I speak a specific language, they don't have the translators. They don't have a Spanish speaking provider because many of the gender affirming clinics that exist in the United States are primarily English speaking. Some may have access to language interpreters, but it is very hard to find language interpreters if you speak a language that is outside the common norms in the United States. So yes, it is easier to find Spanish speaking interpreters, but let's say you speak a language from a rural part of South Asia, it's going to be very, very hard. And even though there's laws protecting non-English speaking patients to have access to a translator, that doesn't always apply to real world scenarios, especially if you're going to an independent clinic that will need to phone in interpretive services. And also, by the way, you can definitely get charged for interpretive services. And lastly, Betty Jo from down the street has noticed that you've been having an incredibly hard time for the last two years getting access to gender affirming care. So, you, so she offers you her sketchy pamphlet that shows you how to do it from home and how to order it from home. And yes, I know this is this can be done very safely if you're informed, but think, think if you, like I've said, if you really think about the marginalization that trans migrants face, if they don't have access to education on learning how to speak English, learning how to navigate the world in English, learning how to navigate the world in American jargon is what I say. Like it's just the way that Americans speak to each other, just how you can spot scams, how you can spot, um, opportunistic pamphlets versus pamphlets that's actually aimed to inform you on how to do things safely through a harm reduction lens because there's so much out there on the internet right now that can really really harm people even even queer people providing very terrible information because of lack of access to information they make their own own information that they think will help people but ends up harming people and it's, it's not to dig on anyone specifically but I do this is one of the reasons why I started my YouTube channel so as an immigrant you are very much vulnerable to being taken advantage of by the healthcare system you're very much vulnerable to losing access to resources and not having available resources for you when you're in a new country that you don't have citizenship in which means you don't have access to the resources that many of us who have the privilege of being a citizen in that country have. It's incredibly hard to be a trans immigrant where English is not your primary speaking language and to navigate this world and getting access to gender affirming care. My sarcasm aside, this is a huge problem that I've seen when I've been involved in organizing work in Atlanta, but also I've read in the study and, you know, I don't have an answer to what the solutions are, but what I can emphasize is the fact that if you do know a, a trans person who doesn't speak English very well, or who is a migrant, who doesn't have access to legal paperwork, be that ally for them, go to the clinic with them, or, you know, allow them to have someone that can look up resources for them that's reliable and that will help them so that they are not alone in this process. I think that's my biggest message here. Yes, this research is very important to highlight the disparities, but y'all already know I like my solutions because I don't want to just point out the problems. So I think collectively the queer community has always, always been super supportive of each other. And if you have a family member, friend, anybody you know that's struggling with access to gender affirming care, as an immigrant or as a non-English speaking person, please, please offer your help as someone who's educated, especially here in the United States. Anyways, that's my spiel. I know I went on a little bit of a rant, but I do see this a lot. And unfortunately, I have seen some friends uh, experience this and friends have reached out to me for valuable resources. But like I've said, I'm not a monolith. I can't fix everybody's problems. I mean, I'm just speaking to a camera through the internet and I have my own patients that I need to take care of. I can't take care of everyone. So I hope my message has been clear in that we hold on to each other tightly and try to help each other out. Anyways, I hope you gained something from this video. I hope you learned something important in this video and I hope that you'll share this information 
with someone who may benefit from it. Please feel free to follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Formerly Twitter, I guess. Uh, if you want to catch up with my daily life and the things that I do outside of making YouTube videos, and I'll catch y'all in the next one. Mwah. This is Dr. Ben.